Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today for the International Association of Adolescent Health Young Professionals Network third webinar series. The aim of this webinar series is to provide adolescent health-based discussions of diverse content for early career professionals around the world by hosting leading experts in the field. For this webinar, we try to set a time frame that will be accessible to many parts of the world. We will try to organize the future webinars bearing in mind the different time zones of different regions. For those who are not members of IHYPN, please consider joining today. Information on how to join can be found on the IH website. My name is Mindis Kuzulkan and I'll be your moderator today. I'm an assistant professor in the Adolescent Medicine Division at Hacettepe University in Turkey, and I'm one of the co-officers of the IHYPN Education and Training Committee. Before we get started, I would like to let everybody know that the session is being recorded and that the recording will be posted on the IH YouTube channel shortly after. We'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Please use the chat box to submit any questions you might have throughout the webinar. We will moderate the chat box and review all the questions. Unfortunately, we'll only be able to select a few to ask our speaker. However, we are hoping to arrange future webinars inspired by your questions, so I encourage every participant to ask questions and share their thoughts. Well, I'm quite honored to present our speaker today, Professor Dr. Susan Sawyer. She'll be answering our questions on the history and the importance of adolescent health, her valuable contributions to the field, and leadership in global adolescent health. Professor Susan Sawyer holds the Jeff and Helen Hanbury Chair of Adolescent Health at the University of Melbourne and is Director of the Centre for Adolescent Health at the Royal Children's Hospital, a World Health Organization collaborating centre. A pediatrician by training, she has advanced the field of adolescent health in Australia and beyond. Her clinical and research interests primarily relate to quality health care for adolescents, including mental health care. She was a commissioner for the Lancet Commission on Adolescent Health and Wellbeing, which has proven highly influential in building an understanding of the triple dividend that comes from investing in adolescents. She is currently the president of the International Ad Association for Adolescent Health. Professor Sawyer, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really delighted to be with you and it's just wonderful to see so many familiar names on the panel as well. I feel like I'm among lots of friends. So um, hello to you all. And just to say that I'm speaking to you in Melbourne, Australia, which is the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin, nature, uh, Kulin Nation. So our Aboriginal um, greeting and acknowledgement in a sense that we do in Australia. Um, thank you so much. Um, so if everybody is ready and if you're ready, I'd like to start with our first question. Um, so, Professor Sawyer, um, what is unique about the adolescent period and why would special attention be given to adolescents within health services? I'm sure all of you on the line know that adolescence is such a profound period of growth and development that really is um, bounded by, in a sense, puberty, which we think of as marking the start of adolescence, this profound period of growth within the human life course where there is biological growth, cognitive growth, social, emotional development. But puberty not only signals, if you like, reproductive capacity, but a change in the social orientation beyond the family as the critical unit of orientation to one in which the world becomes larger for young people, where uh, their peer group uh, becomes um, a much broader influence, in addition to the continued influence of family. Um, thank you so much. Um, so, um, could you tell us how did the subspecialty of adolescent medicine emerge? Um, the subspecialty area of adolescent medicine really emerged in the States in the early 1950s, so a surprisingly long time ago when a, a US primary care doctor by the name of Jane, James Roscoe Gallagher, or Ros as he was known, started an adolescence unit at Boston Children's Hospital. And that was in, as I said, 51. And it's really interesting to appreciate that, that um, the reason that he started that was because he was a family doctor at a boys boarding school in Massachusetts and really came to appreciate the significance of the 
period of adolescence and realised how neglected adolescence was within the life course, within his own training. And Ros really proceeded then to train a cadre of what turned out to be future leaders of adolescent medicine in the states who proceeded to establish um, their own units throughout um, uh, both um, North America in the States and Canada. He wrote the first textbook on adolescent medicine in 1960. And he also had a major international influence so that, for example, in Australia, Dr. Murray Williams, who uh, was the founder of the International Association of Adolescent Health, trained with Ros Gallagher in the early 70s for two years. And Murray also work, came into um, adolescent health through being a school doctor, and he proceeded to work in school health services. In other parts of the world, adolescent health and medicine has developed in different ways at different times. And so, for example, there's quite a strong history of adolescent medicine in a number of Latin American countries like Brazil and Argentina, in a, number of, uh, in a limited number of European countries such as Switzerland, but also perhaps surprisingly in Israel. And this is where individuals have really championed change. But the challenge that we currently have is that in countries with the largest population of adolescents with the greatest need are those countries in which adolescent health and medicine is still very much in its infancy. Yeah. Um, so uh, why do you think um, the adolescent health and medicine receive so little attention worldwide? Um, so certainly in, in those low and middle income countries, I think that largely it's been because they have been so overwhelmed by the burden of disease in very, very young children. Uh, and in maternal health as well. So the focus has really been on maternal and child health. And that was certainly the focus of the Millennium Development Goals as we need. But it is interesting to think in terms of where does adolescent medicine in terms of a clinical uh, orientation sit in high income countries and why has it developed there? Because in most high income countries, if we sort of look back historically, medical expertise has in a sense, typically developed from the perspective of treating disorders. So fields of cardiology and gastroenterology, neurology have developed with a shared group of disorders and an expertise around that. Other areas of medical expertise have developed in a settings-based approach requiring physical space as well as technical expertise and we can think about you know emergency medicine or intensive care or neonatology with its focus on NICU. Other areas of clinical practice have evolved to much more place the patient and the family at the centre combining both clinical expertise and an appreciation of settings and in that regard adolescent and young adult medicine I think has got much more in common with say palliative care or geriatric medicine that places patients and families at the center than it does with say cardiology or ICU, notwithstanding obviously that adolescents have cardiac issues and may require intensive care. But I think you know, one of the things I've realized in my travels around the world is that different countries have developed different clinical programs in response to the different nature of health issues and in many ways in filling the gaps of what hasn't been provided in existing services. There's no single set of disorders um, that adolescent um, medicine deals with, although increasingly my sense is that it deals with a very complex group of disorders that sit at the interface of medicine, of mental health, um, of sexual health, where they really require a, 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 a strong, and need a strong sort of understanding of settings as well. And the challenges, and getting back to your question, one of the reasons that these, these services, I think, haven't developed until more recently is that many of the health, these complex health concerns are not viewed by health managers or university leaders as priority or core areas, perhaps largely because many of them, such as sexual health or mental health, are associated with a high level of stigma. And then this is sort of reflected at an international level or at an institutional level where there's sort of then a lack of leadership so that even if people do train in adolescent medicine, the lack of institutional leadership means that there's often then not the jobs available and that people then move into different areas. 
But I think also the lack of worldwide attention at a global level also reflects that the field has lacked what I'd think of as a shared narrative about why adolescence matters, what are the critical health areas, um, what are the critical aspects of health that affect young people of different ages, what's the extent and the influence of social determinants um, that affect adolescence. And it's really, I think, this lack of a narrative which has contributed to a lack of investment. And that's all over the world in terms of adolescent health. And this has been, in a sense, facilitated and it, because we've had a lack of both national and global data, and that this has allowed a perpetuation of what I'd suggest is a myth that adolescence is the healthiest period of life and that adolescents will do fine whatever we do. And it was really only in high income countries, it seems to me, in the 1980s onwards, that there was really then a growing appreciation that this policy approach, if you like, of benign neglect was not working and that we really needed to think about doing things differently. And that sort of understanding, I think, is only now starting to be appreciated in low and middle income countries because of the very large population cohort of older children, adolescents and young adults um, that are being that is reflecting the, the better job that these countries are doing in terms of reducing mortality of the youngest children. Um, thank you, Dr. Sawyer. So um, you mentioned like one of the biggest problems is that we are missing a lot of data, the mortality and morbidity data worldwide. So how do you think we can overcome, uh, how do you think we can collect um, data from uh, the regions, especially where the adolescent population is highest, but we don't have any data at all? So I think in a number of countries we do have data, but we just don't aggregate it in ways that bring visibility to adolescents, by which I mean, in, for example, pediatric services, they might be collected, or in population services that are led from a children's health perspective, there might be data that say collected on zero to 14 year olds. Mm -hmm. But it's often not disaggregated where you're looking, say, at uh, zero to five, um, zero to four, five mm -hmm. to nine, or 10 to 14 year olds, so that the adolescents are missing even within that grouping. And, you know, obviously, as we know, the health issues affecting four-year-olds are very different to 14-year-olds. And similarly, when we look at adult population data collection systems globally, um, young people aged, say, 15 upwards are uh, aggregated with up to 65-year-olds and, again, not disaggregated. So I think the first thing that we could be doing is bringing uh, a, a, a tighter lens on the adolescent age group and disaggregating even that 10 to 24 year old age group into those typical five year demographic age bands. But you are right in that across global data systems fairly broadly, um, there has yet really to be the investment needed in thinking about what's the sort of data that we would really be wanting to collect. Now, at the moment, um, there is an interagency group within WHO that's doing a really good job in terms of really trying to, in a sense, interrogate the global data collection system and really think much more strategically about um, what we really might need. But that data goes way beyond the health system. So, for example, with colleagues at the Centre for Adolescent Health, I've recently been doing some work around the notion of health promoting schools and schools as being a really important setting where health emerges in ch older children and adolescents. And yet, obviously, the data that ministries of education are interested in collecting is perhaps very different to that that we, from a health perspective, might be interested in collecting. So I think there are some really big challenges, but the pleasing thing is that people are really starting to grapple in much more strategic ways with some of these questions. Um, thank you so much. Um, so, what do you think, what are the benefits of investing in uh, adolescent health and well-being? Okay, in the Lancet Commission that um, we published, that was led by George Patton in um, 2016, and which I had a huge privilege of being, um, having a senior role in that, we introduced the language of the triple dividend, by which we referred to the benefits that can accrue when we get investments right in the period of adolescence itself. So for example, that we might 
uh, be promoting continued engagement in education, um, uh, reduced suicides in young people, fewer accidents and injuries. So there are benefits during adolescence itself, with the second part of that dividend being that as adolescents mature into healthier adults, they carry obviously um, that um, dividend of health across the life course. And the example I typically use there is tobacco. You know, if you don't start smoking as an adolescent, you're very unlikely to smoke as an adult. And growing up as a non-smoker is probably one of the biggest investments you can make in terms of your future health. And then the third part of that triple dividend is the intergenerational benefit that comes from when uh, people who parent parent at an older age when they are more educated, meaning that, that women are much more likely to have power in terms of their family relationships, make healthy decisions for their children, such as breastfeeding and immunization, and are more likely to be wealth, wealthier at the time that they do parent. So there are tremendous benefits that come from investing. Our colleague Peter Sheehan has done some work that was published, I think it was in about 2017, which was really the first investment case looking at what's the benefit cost ratio for every dollar that you might invest in promoting adolescent health. And, they are, and so the benefit cost ratio is, you know, what's the return on that investment? And BCRs of two are considered to be pretty good. A BCR of one is neutral. For every dollar you invest, you get a dollar back. So there's no intrinsic benefit. But in terms of um, politics, for example, and you know, political cabinets and where they choose to invest their money, a BCR of two is considered a good investment. And Peter and colleagues' uh, piece of work they did was demonstrating that uh, across a suite of investments, and these were not the intergenerational benefits, but this was a limited suite of investments, there was a benefit cost ratio of 10, i.e. for every dollar you invested, a tenfold return. So these are remarkably powerful investments. Yeah, um, they're really, really remarkable. Um, so I have briefly introduced your inspiring biography to our audience. Uh, but I think listening to your personal experiences and recommendations will guide many young professionals, like me, in our efforts to become better advocates and future experts. So could you uh, tell us a little bit about how did you start your career in adolescent health? Oh my gosh. Um, well, I certainly didn't start really a career in adolescent health. It was a very, it was something I fell into. Nothing, none of this sort of strategic career planning that all of you young pups online um, now engage in. Um, you know, I entered medicine with my mum as a country GP, which I think was a pretty powerful influence and in why I went into medicine. But as a typical rebellious adolescent, intent on finding my own path. I, the one thing I knew I didn't want to be was a country GP. Um, you know, I had no training in adolescent health as an undergraduate and actually didn't have any training in adolescent medicine as, when I entered my pediatric practice, uh, you know, my pediatric training as well. But I ended up deciding to train in respiratory pediatrics in the subspecialty area, in part because at that time, very much influenced by um, State of the World, you know, UNICEF State of the World Children's Reports each year and looking at those pie charts of where were the greatest killers. And it was either going to be gastroenterology or respiratory pediatrics that I was going to go into. Um, but it was then during my training in respiratory medicine where I had was one of very few female English speaking trainees. And this is, I graduated from medicine in 1985, so I turned 60 last year. <laughs> So this is in the early um, 1990s. Um, and there were, uh, we, the unit looked after a lot of adolescents with cystic fibrosis, a complex chronic respiratory condition with a lot of multi-system effects. And this was right at the time where adolescents were starting to be expecting now to survive through adolescence at a time when previously they had died. And I had some very uh, formative experiences, typically late at night on the wards when everyone else had gone home and you'd be sitting on the end of a bed and just in that space, quiet space, when you're just sort of writing up notes or just sort of sitting there, you know, patients would come out to the nursing station or whilst you're sitting on the bed doing something else with often these very deep and meaningful questions. And I felt really remarkably privileged to be able to engage with them. So that sort of was a but then really it was a group of young girls with cystic fibrosis who very early on sort of pounced upon me with a whole lot of questions about sexual and reproductive health. 
I mean, I just never thought about these issues. Um, some of you will know that men with cystic fibrosis lack a vas deferens, so biologically, uh, it's like a, a, an adult male with a vasectomy. And these girls sensibly were asking questions about their own fertility status and whether they would be able to have children, whether they should be using contraception. And I felt really dumb because I just never thought about these issues at all. And they were very insistent that I find out the answers. And I was very clear that I was going to be doing some other area of research. But um, very interesting how what happens when you listen to young people. There are some dangers because I ended up doing my doctoral research describing the new morbidities affecting adolescents with CF that included sexual and reproductive health. Um, I then went on to spend a couple of years in the States doing a postdoc at Harvard in aerosol physiology of all things, and then basically returned then to the University of Melbourne, the World Children's Hospital, the Centre for Adolescent Health, where I've essentially been ever since. But over time, um, you know, gradually pivoted much more towards adolescent medicine than respiratory medicine, which is still a, absolutely dear to my heart. But I really felt that the lack of leadership expertise in adolescent medicine in Australia at that time really meant that my skills would be much more influential if I focused more on adolescent medicine than respiratory medicine. And you contributed a lot uh, in developing adolescent health in Australia. So can you share some of your experiences? Yeah, well, certainly the first 10 years or so that I was back from the States, here I was in the Centre for Adolescent Health that was led by Professor Glenn Bowes, the inaugural director, um, that built on a small adolescent medicine clinical service that uh, Dr. John Court had established in the early 80s. So our Centre for Adolescent Health was established, um, as Molly reminded me, um, on the, the um, Young Professionals Network 30 years ago this year. But for that first decade, I was really very heavily invested in developing adolescent medicine and clinical services in the hospital, um, in ensuring that undergraduate medical training at the University of Melbourne, as well as then paediatric training, was much more inclusive of adolescent health and medicine. So I wrote lots of chapters in textbooks for um, undergraduate medical students and paediatric trainees. And, you know, was really thrilled um, you know, after, probably would have been after about a decade of that, that uh, Michael Marks, who was, you know, heading up our undergraduate medical training, phoned me up and said, I'm thinking we should change the name of our paediatric course to Child and Adolescent Health. What do you reckon? And I laughed thinking, well, of course I'm going to be hugely excited about that. But what I was particularly excited about was that it wasn't my idea, but it was someone else's idea outside of the field of adolescent health and medicine. Following that, or was, was probably overlapping with that, I sort of ended up um, on a senior committee, and again, it was by chance within the Royal Australasian College of Physicians, which oversees, sub, uh, oversees specialty training in both adult medicine and paediatrics in Australia. And in that national committee, um, where I felt very much the junior burger and I felt very out of place for the first few years, but Don Robertson, who chaired that committee, was someone who I had worked with as a, as a resident. Um, and so I felt safe enough to be a bit of a constant sort of thorn in his ear, I think, because I was always asking, well, and what about adolescents? And what about adolescents? And finally, after about three years on this committee, Don turned around and said I, that he wanted to establish a new committee on adolescents. Um, health within the college, that he wanted me to chair it. He wanted me to basically come back to the college, uh, you know, having developed the terms of reference for the committee, put a committee together and tell the college basically what it should do in terms of advancing adolescent health and medicine through this training perspective. And so I then spent, you know, really five years of hard yards developing an accreditation framework, firstly for basic training for all paediatric trainees and all adult medicine trainees. And that then led to the agreement from the college to approve the notion of subspecialist training in adolescence and young adult medicine, as we call it in Australia. That then took a long while for a range of complex reasons. So it was actually only in 2017 that our trainees in paediatric and adult medicine are now able to train in, it, it will get accreditation, they've always been able to train, but to get formal accreditation for their training in adolescence and young adult medicine. And for me, that was a hugely exciting achievement because it basically means you have 
institutionalized, you've put in place the systems that now enable this to continue over time. And that, you know, those of us, um, you know, who led, led to that work happening can now sort of step away. But I suppose there's, there's one more thing I'd like to share in terms of my efforts in Australia, and that was really about the reinvigoration of the Australian Association for Adolescent Health that really was established probably about 60 years ago. But when I returned from the States, the Centre for Adolescent Health was running a small annual meeting um, on adolescent medicine that had sort of become the de facto National Australian Adolescent Health and Medicine meeting, as well as the meeting for New Zealand. And the leadership really at that time in Australia was in Melbourne, Sydney, and in Auckland, New Zealand. And after about eight years of that meeting, um, I really pushed hard to try and see, a, and we developed a rotation cycle between those three centres. We had a couple of rounds of that. And for a range of reasons then worked very hard to say, okay, let's have this meeting hosted, not just by say the Centre for Adolescent Health in Melbourne or the Centre for Youth Health in New Zealand, but rather from the Australian Association of Adolescent Health that could then hold the funds and host the meeting year after year. So that was a lot of work um, behind the scenes to get that up and running. But I think it's one of the reasons that I'm so, so much a supporter of national associations for adolescent health and medicine, because this is where country by country, those leadership efforts really play out. Um, and I'm you know, really chuffed that we now have uh, a, a really um, much more vibrant association. And I'm thrilled that actually now the, um, Melissa Kang from Sydney did a fabulous job in terms of really reinvigorating uh, our Australian association. Um, so yeah. These are all very incredible and um, really inspiring achievements. And um, could you also tell us how did you become involved in uh, IAH? So in terms of IAAH, um, purely serendipitously, um, the, I knew nothing about um, the International Association of Adolescent Health, really, apart from I, I first got out to dinner at the, the US Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine meeting with a few of the IAAH global leaders sort of just by chance. And so I you know, got to know some of them a, a little bit. Uh, and they were always um, good fun. And there was an international chapter at SAM where, you know, that was the, the, the most fun part of was getting together with the, the, the aliens, the, the non-Americans, as nice as the Americans were. But I felt at the time I had much more in common in terms of the state of adolescent medicine with those who were not from America. But in 2008, I think it was, um, Uli Bullmann from Switzerland, who was the then president of the International Association for Adolescent Health, had arranged that the World Congress was going to be held in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. And in terms of the proximity, you know, in terms of time zone and geography, he asked would I take on the role of the scientific chair of the meeting which I felt um, incredibly intimidated about by that invitation. But finally, after a lot of soul searching and discussions with my colleagues and particularly um, Thiaga Nataraj, a past trainee um, who was uh, active in, uh, in Malaysia and adolescent health and paediatrics, felt sufficiently comfortable uh, to take that on. That was a, a lovely meeting. Um, and following that, at the elections, I was then encouraged to stand for the Vice President for Oceania for Australia and New Zealand and had two four-year terms in that role, firstly working with Lynn Berenger when she was President and then Bruce Dick. And Bruce had to step down a year before the end of his four-year presidency term ended due to a health crisis. And at that time, I was asked to step into the role of President. And that was in the year that, the very start of the year that we were having the World Congress in Delhi. So when was this? 2017? Um, and it involved a huge amount of work that I actually found I really enjoyed. And at that time, I was traveling a hell of a lot for my day job around sort of the work of the Lancet Commission. So I finally decided that actually it was a really opportune time to align some of these global agendas that I was very engaged in um, through the Lancet Commission work. Um, to also try and, in a sense, really help to build 
the, the field of adolescent health and support the development of national um, initiatives uh, through IAAH. And I must say, I feel um, that IAAH as an organisation was very much ahead of its time. You know, I mentioned Murray Williams formed it in 1987. This was formed in Sydney with David Bennett having a very major role in the formation of the organisation. But it, as a, an organisation that was intentionally globally oriented with a council vice president framework that is global in its um, geographical reach, um, I've always said that it felt way ahead of its time and it now feels that the global interest in adolescent health, particularly in low and middle income countries, but also in so many other high income countries, finally now feels that the time is right for IAAH to take on a much more active leadership role, both um, sort of really in internationally. Um, I, I believe there are uh, many young professionals uh, among us with this webinar. And I think uh, they would like to um, improve uh, the adolescent health in their maybe own countries, regions, or even globally uh, in the future. So what advice would you like to give them? Like, um, how do you think they should get involved in global adolescent health? And maybe you can share like what um, you wish you would have done differently when you were starting out. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, I you know, as you will have heard that, that I've been someone who, you know, in addition to having a research career, I have really been invested in trying to build a field. And one doesn't do that from having a stellar research career. One does that in collaboration with others from the ground up. So if there would be one piece of advice to young professionals online, it would be to seek out like-minded colleagues, to seek out um, leaders in your countries uh, who are active in adolescent health, to join um, the International Association of Adolescent Health Young Professionals Network that's hosting this, this webinar as a means of sort of getting a sense of orientation to the field. But you know, particularly what everyone's found obviously in this past year of COVID and no doubt across this year as well, the world is a very small place. Um, and um, you know, when I, um, in this week's Lancet, I, um, I would really bring your attention to a lovely profile piece on Dr. Francisca Agong Handi from Indonesia. She's from Universitas Palita Harapan in Jakarta. And you know, Siska just sent me an email out of the blue one day um, asking for some assistance and I think it's over five years ago that she did that and probably about eight years ago and I've you know worked with her incredibly closely ever since and really um, been incredibly supportive of her efforts to have established now Aka Inaha, the Indonesian Association for Adolescent Health as the other national association established. So one piece of advice Seek out like-minded colleagues. If there isn't a multidisciplinary national association, form one. Um, you don't need anything to, to really form one or just you know, get together once a month and have meetings and you know, invite people to speak to your meetings. But also get some technical expertise. Um, get some training in relevant fields, whether that's clinical fields, whether that's in population health fields, whether that's in policy fields, you know, adolescent health is a very multidisciplinary field, but ensure that you get some technical expertise and training as well. Thank you so much for um, sharing all of your uh, experiences and uh, recommendations uh, for us. Uh, finally, uh, I'd like to ask some questions on the main focus of our webinar about how we can address the gaps in global adults and health and better shape the future. So, um, what do you think about the current place of adolescent health in the global health agenda? I suppose it depends how old you are. <laughs> From where I sit, you know, you can look at it as a as half empty or half full. So, you know, in comparison to where the field was when I started, you know, wow. Um, you know, from being completely absent in the Millennium Development Goals, you know, adolescent health uh, is now recognised, you know, very, even, you know, when we coined the term, virtually coined the term global adolescent health, when we developed a massive open online course that we named global adolescent health, um, 
you know, it was sort of a, a, a line in the sand to say that there is such a field that exists that this is relevant to everyone in, you know, every country. But within the Sustainable Development Goals, adolescents clearly are present. Now, perhaps not as much as some of us would like, but there has been a huge shift. There's been a shift in orientation of appreciation that uh, the health issues affecting adolescents are not simply sexual and reproductive health, as critically as important as they are, but a much broader and more complex suite of health issues. And perhaps again in this COVID year, um, the appreciation of the importance of um, mental health and well-being and adolescents as a very important time of incident um, mental disorder is one that I think many more people now appreciate than they did pre-COVID. So I think the current place is that we do have, for the first time ever, a global strategy for women's, children's and global health. Our, all of our UN agencies really in the past decade have been investing in major uh, reports on the state of adolescent health and development in relationship to them. So for example, UNICEF next year, its um, State of the World Children's Report is really largely going to be focusing on adolescent mental health. But I think that it's a vulnerable position in terms of having a place at the table. And therefore, um, you know, I think that as a community uh, of leaders in adolescent health, this is the time for us not to be losing the momentum that we've sort of built up over the time of the publication of the Lancet Commission that I fear has fallen flat uh, very much in the context of the, glo uh, of the COVID pandemic. And now is the time to be really trying to reinvigorate that because as we all know, whilst adolescents haven't been as much the direct target in terms of health of the pandemic, boy, the indirect effects um, are disproportionately affecting adolescents more than any other age group. Yeah, um, definitely so. Um, what do you think about the gaps between the needs and practices in the field of adolescent health? <laughs> um, gaps everywhere, whether we're talking about <laughs> health services, whether we're talking about absence of research, whether we're talking about the absence of sort of broader social policy frameworks, the absence of clarity about legal frameworks for young people, wherever one looks between needs and practices, there are gaps. And I think I mentioned earlier that the biggest gaps are in those countries that have got the largest population of young people, so the largest numbers of young people, and that's in sub-Saharan Africa and in South Asia. And it's also in these countries where there is the greatest population proportion of adolescents, so adolescents are the largest percentage, if you like, of the overall population, mm -hmm. and where adolescents have got the highest needs in comparison to to adolescents perhaps in high income countries. Mm -hmm. So the biggest gaps are in sub-Saharan Africa, in South Asia, and um, the global field has got a very large amount of work to do to start to fill those gaps. Mm -hmm. um, definitely, and um, like you um, mentioned earlier, um, there are not a lot of um, adolescent health-based education throughout the world. And um, especially those regions with the um, most um, crowded adolescents, they don't um, have any opportunities, uh, especially um, having an education in the adolescent hub. So how do you think we can overcome this gap by providing um, adolescent friendly health services, especially at those regions? Look, I, I think we do have to appreciate that it's not gonna happen overnight. One of the reasons that I'm sort of invested in trying to support initiatives that are aimed at improving the skills of every health professional, you know, particularly with a focus on primary care to work better with young people is that's where the majority of young people are seen. But at the same time, I know that the only way we're going to be able to change the focus of undergraduate medical education and of early um, uh, you know, pre-service education is when we have leaders in adolescent health and medicine who are at a national level who are able to themselves influence those um, uh, uh, curriculum uh, that are run country by country, university by university. So I think we have this sort of 
dual agenda of trying to be making population investments at the same time of supporting um, a small cadre of experts who are really the future, future leaders, who are the ones that are going to build that capacity, engage in the debates and policy uh, discussions with government, and also lead the research initiatives as well. Thank you so much. Um, how can we better advocate to put adolescent health in high level discussions? Well, one of, one of the ways that any of, in that last comment I made, one of the ways that any of that will happen is when young people have a firmer seat at the table. Because in my own conversations, whether it's with um, CEOs of hospitals or whether it's with political leaders, sadly, um, I, I have to say, and I do confess to a little bit of sadness about it, the influence of young voices around the table uh, is much more powerful uh, than professors of adolescent health and medicine. And so I think that we, in the Lancet Commission, we sort of talked about the importance of training grown-ups, training adults to better listen to young people, as well as we also need to be working with young people around how to really gain and amplify their voices in ways that will be influential. And I think as a field, we're still really struggling to do this. Um, I think we are still at risk very broadly of tokenism across many, many different areas. I must say, I'm incredibly proud within IAAH under my watch as president that we've formed the Young Professionals Network that Melissa, you know, you're such a key part of because it seems to me that you know, this is the opportunity where you as the young professional leaders of that young professional network are really telling us as the council, what would you like? What would your constituency like? We've recently had um, you know, a, a large grant from the AstraZeneca Foundation Youth Health Program, and that's really enabling us to actually put some money where our mouth is and to be supporting some of these. So, you know, this is something that I think, not just listening to young people, but finding ways where they can be really actively shaping uh, future pathways for themselves and for other young people who follow. Like you said, we really listen to um, adolescents and we really listen to their uh, opinions and uh, what they really want uh, from us and what their, uh, what they have on their minds. So um, how do you think we can better involve adolescents to voice their own opinions, needs and rights? Look, we really grappled with this question within the Lancet Commission and I don't think really necessarily came up with um, any fabulous answers. There's not a strong evidence base here. But I think it's, um, you know, there are some simple things to do. So rather than just having a single young person on a broader adult committee who is expected to represent all young people and who is likely to feel so intimidated that they don't really know how to engage, it's really thinking about how do we engage with groups of young people um, as well. Not necessarily um, as parallel play, so not necessarily as groups of young people uh, who are separate to where the leadership within organisations are, but also creating separate spaces where young people can really participate. Obviously, and it's been said, you know, many times before, that one of the challenges is in terms of youth participation and listening to young voices is that we know that it's often the most educated and most privileged young people who are the most articulate, who have the most life experiences, the, the best opportunities, who are the ones that then tend to get picked again and again to be participating in this way. So bringing an equity lens and are trying to appreciate how do we engage a diverse group of young people? Because obviously, just like um, you know, me in Australia, I can't speak for what's happening for your country in Turkey, Melis, or for Diana in Indonesia, notwithstanding that I might have some under, you know, some knowledge of what's happening. Similarly, um, adolescents will also have a limited perspective around their own uh, lived experience. So I think we also need to be careful of not having unrealistic expectations or natural thinking about what young people's perspectives will also be able to achieve. But, you know, I don't know about um, 
you know, across the world, uh, the quality of the COVID um, information, the communication information that any of your individual governments have put out. But certainly, um, I've been very critical of some of the communication that was put out in Australia, really feeling that it did a very bad job of, um, uh, of um, communicating a message to young people. And so I think that, you know, when you're wanting to communicate with young people or when you're wanting to develop a resource for young people or when you're wanting to understand what the priority research topics might be, by finding ways of engaging young people around helping with priority setting exercises or around communication strategies, you know, voice of social media, things like that, you know, they're the experts in their lives rather than us. Um, um, Professor Soria, thank you so much. On behalf of IHYPN, uh, I would like to thank you so much for highlighting very important information for all of our attendees by addressing these questions. Uh, we actually got a lot of questions from the audience as well. Uh, I would like to um, take a few um, big day to our uh, time restrictions. Um, so I like to uh, start a question from uh, Nina van der Mark. Um, uh, hello, everyone from the UK. Uh, such an interesting discussion. Uh, coming from a healthy policy perspective, what do you think policymakers and policy influencing institutions, such as uh, think tanks, can do to support health providers, professionals better? Oh, major question. And Nina, I'm um, looking at your name one and seeing the comment in the chat about the Bali um, Global Youth Forum. And were you the sort of 14 or 15 year old back then who we were also concerned about when there was all of that um, protest on stage? It was the most fascinating time. So lovely to see that you're still in the, um, the, the adolescent health area. I can't believe it. And now I've forgotten the question. Melis, repeat the question. Sure. Um, so, um, um, what do you think policymakers can do to support health providers, professionals better? Look, I think policymakers. Um, I, I think it, it is about getting adolescent health on the policy agenda, and recognizing that whilst health services responses are a really important part of that agenda. And I've you know, spent a fair bit of time this evening talking about health services. But some of the most powerful policy initiatives around adolescent health are going to take place outside of the health sector. I mentioned a little bit earlier the importance of the work that we've been doing on health promoting schools and global standards about health promoting schools. And in the Lancet Commission, we sort of highlighted that, you know, among the best investments to be made in promoting adolescent health is retaining uh, both girls and boys, but particularly girls in education. Um, similarly, um, a lot of the legal frameworks that enable young people to confidentially access health services without parental consent or not, as the case may be, are incredibly important to address. And so this is where, from a policy perspective, you know, I'm unable, if I were based in um, many countries in the world, I would be unable to practice the quality and the type of um, adolescent medicine that I teach in Australia because of the expectations that parents would be retained in the entirety of the consultation, whereas in my own practice and what we teach in Australia is that whilst parents are a really important part of the perspective of adolescent health and are really important to have their opinions taken on board, that spending time with young people alone is really important. And if in, in individual countries the policy context does not allow that and where doctors might be at risk of consulting with young people by themselves for even a part of the a consultation, then that's a sort of a, a policy perspective that's incredibly important. We're, in the Lancet Commission, we talked a fair bit about the example of um, uh, sort of graduated driver's licenses, because in many countries that road traffic accidents are one of the biggest killers of young people. And you know, in the States, you can get a driver's license at a very early age, I think it's at the age of about 15 or 16. 
Whereas in Victoria, where I'm based, you can't really get your dri a formal driver's license until you're 18. And even then, we describe these graduated driver's licenses so that you can't have a full license for a couple of years, which means you can't drive with any alcohol for the first two years of having a probationary license. So there are a whole lot of these legal frameworks that have tremendous influence on young people's mortality, on their health and well-being, on how we practice medicine that are way outside of what takes place within the confines of a consultation. Um, and I think that um, we need to be spending more time in that policy space. And that's a space where, again, coming back to the importance of national associations and international associations, that work can be at times pretty dangerous when it's led by individual doctors and it's much more effective when it's done by a national credible association and ideally multiple associations coming together. So an association of paediatrics of, you know, so say the Australian Medical Association, the College of Physicians, the Australian Association of Adolescent Health, our Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, our primary care, uh, association, if they were all to come together with a single message, it would be far more influential at a policy level. Um, and there is another question from uh, Rosa Maria Nancho. Uh, what are your experiences with teleconsultation with teens? Do you think confidentiality and privacy can be easily implemented through this medium? How can we overcome these hindrances? Probably like everyone else online, um, I have had a very rapid immersion in the world of telehealth. Our institution did have, has had a long-standing video conferencing telehealth platform probably for about um, eight years, but I probably had mm, about 10 teleconsultations, if I'm honest, um, up until the pandemic. And then over the last year, um, you know, virtually all of my consultations were, were online. Um, like the questioner, uh, I have really struggled to provide the same quality of care to adolescents online because of the concerns I have about the extent to which they really are in confidential places, you know, with small houses, with flimsy walls, um, with me being uncertain you know, where the parents are really listening at the door, even when I'm asking, so who's in the room? I'd love to know who's there so I can say hello. Um, so it's been a rapid learning curve for all of us. Our group's been contracted um, by WHO to undertake some, uh, or to develop a, a clinical guidance document around telehealth consultations for, for children and adolescents. And we've just recently completed the systematic reviews of both the peer review and the grey literature. And what's fascinating is that there's remarkably little data. There's probably a total of about 120 papers that we identified overall and websites and, peer, uh, and um, sort of grey literature guidance documents. Um, the quality of the literature overall is pretty poor. You know, there's a lot of expert opinion. I think in total there's about eight RCTs. Um, you know, the evidence is largely that you can do, that, that um, you know, telehealth is much better than nothing and you can do a surprise surprisingly large amount on telehealth. But there was remarkably little in the literature. You know, I was really searching as an adolescent physician. I was really interested in the extent to which people were able to describe, you know, the quality of psychosocial assessments online and how they address confidentiality. And there's remarkably little, even in the literature that's come out this year. Um, but I think we've all learnt there are also tremendous benefits of promoting access to care for young people who would previously have been unable to travel, unable to, for example, seek specialist expertise as well. And I think that, um, excuse me, I think the experience of um, sort of recognizing how telehealth sort of enables you to span not just state borders, but national borders as well. I think this we're gonna find is most likely to be the biggest disruptive force in healthcare this past year. I recently wrote um, uh, editorial to a company, a, a systematic review on psychosocial history taking that was published in Journal of Adolescent Health, just a, I think it's online at the moment. And in that, I was signaling that, the, that it, I was quoting a business, um, 
paper that was signaling that the extent of disruption in health services is thought to be, in the last year, is thought to be the equivalent of about five to eight pre-COVID years. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it's really important that we capitalise and amplify some of these approaches and don't just go back to the old way of doing things, but really think about how do we, you know, in that sort of somewhat hard phrase, you know, how do we build back better and take on board the elements that actually have proved highly effective. But, um, you know, being able to see patients face to face is, I have found, pretty, pretty powerful. Um, thank you. And finally, um, I'd like to ask um, a question from Arlinda Susanna. Uh, she says, uh, what do you think is the major impact of this pandemic on our adolescents? As a health provider, sometimes I feel overwhelmed and don't know where to start. Yeah. I... Yes, pause, deep breath. <laughs> um, I was giving a talk a couple of weeks ago to the primary care conference of um, general practitioners in Lebanon, in Beirut. And if we think of, you know, what Lebanon has gone through in terms of their waves of refugees, their, you know, their early experiences of the pandemic, which were pretty awful, and then their huge explosion in August, and now a second wave of the pandemic. You know, my starting point in, in terms of my advice to them was that you know you really have to look after yourself, your family, and your teams, and it's sort of a bit like you know when we all used to fly in the good old days, and you know the um, the oxygen instructions, you know first fit your own mask and only then fit the mask to you know to the others around you, you know to your dependents and children. So I think that recognition that actually it is okay to be focused on you know, needing to ensure that you are okay. And if you're not, to be working with your colleagues, with your families, thinking about how you might do better. And obviously, you know, attending to the ordinary things like physical activity, sleep, um, you know, some time out is really critical. Clearly, adolescents, as I was signaling earlier, whilst they have been relatively, and it is only relatively spared you know, from the awful, awful, um, extent of deaths that we're seeing in the oldest of the of populations around the world um, are really struggling in terms of interruption with schooling, really struggling with impacts in terms of the interruption to their social networks um, and the impact in terms of their um, mental health um, is really quite profound. There's now a couple of quite good studies that are looking at using, so there's one study that I saw recently from the UK and another from the US both of them used repeat cross-sectional waves using the same measures over the last four or five years and demonstrating, um, I can't quite remember the data, um, but you know, demonstrating at least a three to four fold increase in the rate of um, common mental disorders, you know, depression and anxiety in, in young people over the past 12 months. And when we look at breaking down the population, um, it's absolutely the 18 to 24 year old age group that's been much, much more affected than the older age group. So when we think about notion of the triple dividend, they're being affected now, let alone the concerns that many of us have about the, the potential for the persistent impacts across their life course. If, for example, they are forced to get leave, leave school and get married earlier. We're seeing much more in the way of teenage pregnancies in um, poorer states in India, and also I know at least in Indonesia and no doubt in other countries as well. So you know many of the gains that we've achieved, uh, we are at risk of, of losing. Let alone you know the uncertainty, and this is you know the question, a research question of what's ahead of us is what, you know, who have been the young people who have been most affected and as we gradually move into a post immunization stage, is there going to be a natural reduction in mental disorder or is there going to be a persistent high? You know, I know in our own service, we have, our, we run a big eating disorder service and we have been completely overwhelmed by a huge number of young people presenting to our service, you know, uh, a, a, a third more than we would ever see. It's been you know, quite overwhelming and every mental health service across the world is seeing it. But I think the question is, you know, will, will this be a peak and will it then settle in time or is it likely to stay high for some time, which I, I fear. 
and then you know the, the expectation of intergenerational effects in terms of the burden of debt that we are then placing on our, the next generation, you know, let alone the burden, burden of um, on planetary health that we as you know, my generation has so contributed to. Professor Soria, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure having you. And thank you so much to all of you who have attended today's webinar. Uh, I also would like to thank to uh, YPN co-chairs and all the officers for their hard work in preparing this webinar. Please consider uh, joining us again for our next webinar on World Health Day on April 7. And our title is The Impact of COVID-19 on Mentoring, Education and Training in Global Adolescent Health, which will feature Professor Pierre André Michaud. Follow our hashtag IHYPN on social media to stay informed. And you can also use the hashtag IHYPN to share your feedbacks and thoughts about this uh, webinar. Um, we have a, a short evaluation form uh, which will be sent to you in the chat box. It will just take one minute, so uh, please uh, fill that out uh, as well. So thank you again for all of you. Um, we will uh, now um, conclude our webinar.